Namaste and greetings. I, Swati Solanki, researcher at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav, Evam Niti Anusandhan Sanstan, Nai Delhi, extend my warm welcome to you all to IMPRI hashtag web policy talk. Today, we have gathered for a special talk on relations of caste and gender in the time of the pandemic, challenges for feminist and social movements by Dr. Smita M. Patil as a part of the series, the state of gender equality, hashtag gender gaps. This series is organized by Gender Impact Studies Center at IMPRI. It is my privilege to introduce the chair for our session, Professor Vibhuti Patel. Mm -hmm. Ma'am is an eminent uh, gender economist and former professor at Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Mumbai. With the permission of our chair, I would now like to introduce our speaker and discussants for today's talk. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, please. Go ahead. Thank you, ma'am. Our eminent speaker for today's talk is Dr. Smita M. Patil. Ma'am is currently an assistant professor in School of Gender and Development Studies at Indira Gandhi National Open University, New Delhi. She earned her MPhil and PhD from Center for Political Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University. She is recipient of prestigious fellowships such as Dr. Avabai Vadia and Dr. Bumanji Kursheji Vadia Archives for Women Fellowship 2020-21. Asia Leadership Fellowship Program, Japan 2017, Doctoral Fellowship at Center for the Study of Developing Societies and Indian Council of Social Science Research, Delhi, and many more. She has extensively published at national and international level. Her recent publications include Law of One's Own on Dalit Women's Arduous Struggles for Social Justice, Gender Equity and COVID-19 Dalit Standpoints, Class, Caste, and Gender, the Brahmanizing Online Sphere on Larger Questions of Caste, Gender, and Patriarchy, and Reading Caste, Gender, and Sexuality in Dalit Writings. Her areas of interest are Women's and Gender uh, Studies, Gender and Law, Political and Social Theory, Caste and Identity Politics, Education, and so on. Our discussants for today's talk are Professor Uma Chakravarti, who is an eminent feminist historian and former reader at Miranda House University of Delhi, and Dr. Ajay Gudavarti, who is Associate Professor at Center for Political Studies, School of Social Sciences, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. Now, I invite our Chair, Professor Vibhuti Patel, for her introductory remarks and invite our speaker and panelist. Ma'am, over to you. Yeah. First of all, I would like to express my heartfelt thanks to Dr. Arjun Kumar uh, for giving us this platform to discuss such an important concern, which is relations of caste and gender in the time of pandemic, uh, challenges for feminist and social movements. It also gives me great pleasure to be on the same podium where Dr. Uma Chakravarti, Dr. Ajay, and uh, my old friend, Smita Patil, with whom I have worked for a long time in a IGNO School of Gender and Development Studies, developing various courses. Uh, so today is a very important uh, occasion and it's also a historic moment where we are focusing on the very important intersectionality that is uh, faced by India uh, because of the 5,000 years of uh, uh, patriarchal control over the most of the population Shudras and Ati Shudras. Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar's analysis of inequality in a caste-based society is based in the concept of graded inequality, where there is no such class as completely underprivileged, un, uh, unprivileged class, except the one which is at the base of the socio-cultural pyramid. Using this lens, if we examine relations of caste and gender in the time of pandemic, the ground level reality, as well as studies based on life worlds of women from varied backgrounds, they reveal that uh, while women from the upper caste and upper class, middle class have faced highly gendered oppression and violence during the lockdown. It is the SC, ST, OBC and Muslim women who uh, from the un underserved classes and poor women who faced uh, innumerable difficulties and challenges. Uh, and uh, in the tribal areas also, they have faced triple bind of uh, all these women, they have faced triple binds of caste, ethnicity, class, and gender. Uh, 
Women from minority communities face religious oppression, caste-based discrimination, stigma for being poor. All of them faced intense gender violence. They have been subject to precarious living, biopolitical depressions, and exposed to multiple vulnerabilities of unemployment, illnesses, and social exclusion. Their systematic structural oppression got exacerbated during the pandemic. Exponential increase in atrocities against Dalit, tribal, and Muslim women during the last 15 months of the pandemic imposed social isolation bears witness to the deplorable phenomenon. Gated upper caste communities stigmatized and humiliated working class women as carriers of COVID-19 virus. Women domestic workers, vendors face tremendous hardship and unsurmountable difficulties due to such biases and prejudices. Most of the informal sector workers in Indian economy are from SC, ST, OBC, and uh, Muslim communities. Several studies, CMI studies, uh, Ashwini Deshpande study also has shown that. Uh, during the complete national lockdown and partial lockdowns till now, uh, absence of public transport and also the shutting down of all economic activities rendered over 3 lakh migrant workers in the industrial and construction sector uh, in the major Indian cities, they are rendered jobless. Women in the informal sector constitute 94% of the workforce, majority of them being the migrant workers from SC, ST, OBC, and Muslim communities. They lost their livelihood and were forced to reverse migrate. Even in their native places, they face stigma. And the treatment given to them reminded us of a Nazi Germany, where they were barricaded and showered with disinfectants. Those images are still haunting us. Upper class travelers at the airport had not to face such degradation, humiliation, and stigma. Social security, social protection, labor standards, and supportive measures for the urban, rural, and tribal masses have become elusive. To understand the larger meaning that interlinked social spaces of Dalit women and COVID-19, today we have Dr. Smita Patil, who will initiate the discussion on relations of caste and gender in the time of pandemic and challenges for the feminist and social movements. And our discussants today are Dr. Uma Chakravarti, a renowned feminist historian and an expert who has made pioneering contribution on intersectional perspectives on caste, caste and gender. And Dr. Ajay Gurwarti, Associate Professor at Jawaharlal Nehru University, Delhi, whose specialization is in political theory, especially critical theory, contemporary political movements, and post-colonial theory, and the debates on civil society. So I think today we are going to have a very, very enlightening and uh, very educative discussion. And now I request Dr. Smita Patil to take over. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Vibhuti Patil. And let me also uh, thank to uh, Dr. Arjun and Swati uh, uh, for inviting me to share my few ideas here. Uh, today I'm going to speak about this relationship of caste and gender in the time of pandemic and challenges for the feminist and social movement. Um, this is a, a paper which I'm contributing in fact to some international journal, and this is a part of that paper which uh, I thought of, uh, I will present. Uh, it's about democracy and the pandemic. Um, so it's a part of that paper. Uh, now coming back to the question which I would like to argue through this paper uh, is that, uh, how do we understand the relationship of caste and gender in the background of the pandemic? Uh, and how, you know, uh, COVID-19 and its popular construction projected pandemic as something that affects uh, people across different social locations. Then how do we see this debate of touch and untouch, which is again evolved and the language of the social distancing, which emerged again, and we need to revisit this. So genealogy of the anti-cast assertion, uh, and it shows us that the ways in which it, is, it has engaged this, you know, the life of the social and political lives of the Dalit. It also demonstrated that how the trajectories of such political consciousness address the ideas related to the health, well-being, and various forms of stigma, as our chairperson already mentioned, and related to the disease. 
At the same time, the violence against Dalit women during the pandemic shows the vicious connection of the caste, gender, and patriarchy in new liberal phase of the capitalism. On one hand, we see that the number of atrocities against Dalit women increasing. At the same time, or, you know, one would see that uh, you know the organized, uh, unorganized sector, informal sectors. Uh, that is, you know, somewhere that, you know, the center uh, and the regimes have also withdrawn also the new liberalism, the ways in its function in those sector. So my, um, in the aim that what I would like to argue this, uh, through this talk is that what are the position of the feminist and social movement related to the interlinkages of the caste and gender in the time of pandemic? Is there any dialogue among these activists and the academician that engages with the question of intersection of caste, gender, and patriarchy in relation to pandemic? Whether Dalit feminists have developed any critique to the position of the feminist and the social movements on the issues related to the Dalit woman. So this broadly, this lecture is trying to articulate also the nature of the politics. And um, also one of the important point which I want to begin with is that what happens to the largest democracy in the time of pandemic? As we all of us know that the landmark victory of Bharatiya Janata Party with large number of 300 seats in 2019 general election shows us the reclaiming of the right wing ideology and power in the space of Indian democracy. There are a number of facts that can be discussed regarding the winning of Bharatiya Janata Party. However, under the representation of the People's Act of 1951, it is a clear mandate to the BJP to work for the people of India. At the same time, it opens up the serious debate on the number of issues such as question of citizenship, location of the minority and marginal communities, categories such as women, tribal Dalits, who are trying to articulate an alternative perspective to preserve the democratic values of the Indian democracy. As the country was going through several challenges, and we know that the ways in which that farmer protest citizenship bill, uh, it was going on, and the number of you know, things which was actually uh, coming together, the arrival of the lock lockdown pandemic and further the lockdown, in fact, raises a few questions. Um, we all of us know that the intervention uh, that the, you know, how, how the woman, I mean, how everyday basis the people suffered when the first lockdown happened. And uh, one, one has to also uh, go and look at these debates uh, from the larger perspective, uh, uh, how, you know, uh, at international level, this discourse was going on. Now, if we look at the, uh, you know, the initial debate, the World Health Organization, uh, you know, has given instructions to maintain the hygiene, washing hands, using masks, use of sanitizer, keeping social distancing, and so on. Now, the one of the significant question which one has to ask is that pandemics able to translate the markers of the society, or is it the mere pandemic can single out something that is able to analyze social distancing in real life rather than its symbolic constriction? If one is going to look at even the private and public lives of the Dalit women, you know, the ways in which it determines, you know, it has, it has several, uh, you know, ways to look at this. So the category of the, again, social distancing, which one has to actually, you know, look into and how it is reproducing the stigma or the oppressive memory, uh, caste, gender stereotype, and uh, the violence. Now, if you look at that, the whole debate of the WHO, um, one would see that uh, eventually that this terminology social distancing, which was used by them, it, it, it actually, you know, eventually changed and they started using the word physical distancing. Now, epistemological shift of the social and physical distancing provokes, provokes us to think about the social body of the Dalit woman within internal and external patriarchy. For, uh, question of the social and physical distancing may have different connotation in South Asian context. And uh, in order to understand further, one would also relate this debate, um, you know, uh, in the context of the race, if one has to actually rethink about this debate again. So Indian situation, if we look at social distancing, 
this category, cleanliness hygiene have to be propped in the background of the coexistence of the changing caste equation and the COVID-19. Now, now, we all of us knows that, you know, this debate of the purity and the pollution, which is very much there. And, uh, you know, if we can, I mean, there's a lot of work done in sociology and um, Ambedkar's own work, and um, one would actually engage with the several debate of uh, by locating those, you know, the rich work which was contributed by many scholars. But then, uh, how do we see this debate when it comes to the Indian caste institution and the brutal form of the caste ideology? The foundation of the Hindu religion is based on its distinct structural hierarchy of the caste system. And I would not explain here because we all of us know the, how those hierarchy works. But as uh, one is born as a Brahmin, then it's a purist that it is the most polluted who is at the bottom. So caste has been growing through defenders across various spectrums of the Indian life. Scholars have done the work and analyzed how caste is being changing as per the concerned moves of those who privilege from such inhuman system. The denial of the right to live life with the dignity, self-respect, equality, distribution of resources, monopolization of power in public and private spheres are the common character of the dominant caste project. Caste has been penetrated through other religions, also such as Islam, Christian, Tea Parsi, and etc. And this debate of touch and untouchability have conditioned these religions as well. Touch is imagined as spiritual healers in Christianity. Islam reject the categorization of purity and pollution. But the, in addition to that, Buddhism, Sikhism, and Jainism also discard this reactionary social practices based on the purity. How your caste has destroyed the sense of equality, even in Islam, Christianity, and other religions. Therefore, those who converted to this religion due to the oppressive caste-based Hindu religion have to confront the caste in Christianity, Islam, and so on. Now, the Brahminic appropriation of these religions have uh, strengthened the interconnection of the caste and patriarchy, state and its missionary the ways in which it function and the ways in which that, you know, the, uh, I would call it unscientific ways, which were there, uh, it has again, you know, uh, propagated that uh, a, a populist politics and dominant religion, the ways in which, you know, it was actually reflected in the private and public spaces in India. Now, one has to also, uh, you know, probe whether Polarization of basis of caste ever disappeared in India in relation to destructive pandemic or not? Um, if we relate this debate also interestingly, because Ambedkar stated in one of the uh, his writing, which he has written and published way back, and he he said that the possibility that how untouchability emerged also, and if you read his volume, but I'm just quickly going through uh, that. Uh, he said that since the low caste, low class people, they were the, uh, they, they, they were the one who in fact uh, was critically engaging with the Buddhism. And, um, it's a, uh, and therefore one of the way out was that the untouchability was came into existence and emerged as a response to the Buddhism also. Uh, there's a long debate, in fact, Ambedkar uh, has taken a position that how it emerged, how this uh, low caste. In fact, um, we're the only one how oh, the Hindu religion and the people who were following that, how that, you know, oh, the um, uh, appropriation uh, happened of the Buddhism into Hindu religion. There's a whole debate, but I'll just leave it here. Um, then the next question which comes in is that uh, we need to, I mean, learn from the history also. And the pandemic is not something new. If you even look at uh, the debate, for instance, if you look at the debate particularly, uh, which emerged uh, in you know the plague pandemic, uh, which again arrived um, from the Hong Kong, and this time if we look at even the COVID, COVID, which again arrived through the air travel, you know, so there's a common things that both the things, and if you look at even the documents which are there, 
related with the pandemic, plague pandemic, and the documentation is extremely rich because I must say that today, if I want to do tomorrow, any generation people after 20 years have to look into those uh, you know, reports. We do not have anything concrete to offer to the new researcher because the whole question is about you know, how the history is documented here. Now, if we look at the several reports which, which are available, uh, and which is preserved by the British government also, and all the uh, one would see that the Bombay Plague uh, Committee has played a significant role, and there are a number of you know committees which were established during that time to you know uh, to to battle this uh, uh, pandemic of the plague, and you know how. Uh, uh, how search used to happen, hospitalization happens, then there was a whole lot of infection to the corpse, and then disposal of the bodies. And every state there is a mission and there is an intervention of the British officer. At the same time that this document also tells us and speak out and inform us that how caste prejudices and customs were there during that time, it was also very much worse and similar at some time. Now, if, I mean, if there are a number of reports um, and it's time and again, Britishers used to do this uh, um, every time because, you know, within 15 days, this new report will be out and there's a constant effort that how do we maintain basically, uh, you know, or how do we save the life of people? How do we actually maintain uh, that, uh, what I would call it that, a mechanism in which that one can actually, you know, uh, uh, try to create that, uh, how, you know, the functional way, the governance, uh, which was in a positive sense, which I'm seeing here. Uh, and each document tell us that, uh, uh, because one would see that uh, there's also been a division of the hospital, which people demanded, and eventually it was accepted because on the caste basis. Now, um, today also you would see that the ways in which that, for instance, uh, uh, the example which I want to say that serving the food to the low caste. During that time also, it, it was a big issue. Even today, it is a big issue, serving the food by the low caste or, uh, you know, the food cooked by the Anganwadi workers and served to the people. So then, uh, um, I mean, and there was a constant, actually a debate and a demand from the privileged class caste community that, you know, the low caste should not try to interfere. And you would see that uh, each report will tell us and inform us that, um, there were independent and private hospital categorically mentioned by each community. So the rich people established that with the help of the Britishers, but the practice of the caste was very much there and the discrimination was very much there. Today, even uh, you see, if we look at, uh, you know, the media, the visual media, one would see that the ways in which that, uh, the, those oppressed people, caste community people, minority community members refuse to eat all the food served by even the Dalit woman. And even in the quarantine center, the ways in which the discrimination is happening. Um, I just wanted to flag here that the immense contribution which has been done during the plague pandemic was the Satyashodak movement. And uh, I'm looking forward to the article and thanks to my friend Prabhupada Paul introducing these debates to me because uh, I was very much aware about the contribution of uh, Savitri Bhai Phule because she used to take Dalit Shudra, Nati Shudra, which uh, we call it the OBC and the, you know, untouchable children. And she used to brought them um, and uh, one has to also understand that there was no transport. So she literally used to lift them, bring from one place to the other by walking uh, distance from one place to other and bring to those kids and people to her son's hospital. Uh, she called her son when, when the pandemic came, she, she asked her son to come and in fact, you know, serve to those people also in Hadapsar and other parts of the places. So there's an immense contribution which Satya Siddhak movement also did it in order to save the life of the people, particularly from, I mean, across the people, but also uh, for the people of the Shudras and Ati Shudras. Now, um, if you look at that, the similar kind of things were given today in the pandemic and the previously, like cleanliness, hygiene, sanitation. 
uh, during the even the bubonic plague came. And if you look at even those reports, and uh, one of the fantastic books which I would like the students to read is Prashant Kidambi's book on this. And also uh, uh, the number of you know essays which got published and many historians have actually done a fantastic work on this. So one, one has to go and see that how even uh, you know the scavenging community which has been written as a bhangi in those reports have been you know uh, at risk. And uh, it is documented at every hospital there were two bhangis were given a job to do the sanitation workers. Now, even today, if we look at, in fact, the sanitation workers, scavengers, and their health, it is at risk, even today. And, you know, uh, uh, there's a much more celebration, and the political uh, institution termed them as a COVID heroes. Um, you know, people also, the privileged people, called them as a COVID heroes. So these, and the local people also then garlanding the, uh, the, the garbage picker and who cleans the urban colonies and the city on the regular basis. But who, who thinks about their life, how they lead the life? That is something which we need to actually think and rethink about. Uh, they are not supported by the PPT tickets even today, hand gloves, sanitizers, and no safety measures are there by the state or the public hospital. Women sanitation workers, in fact, face major problems. And they, they're not even getting regular salaries because most of them are contractual workers in all institutions. And uh, I have, during the pandemic, I have done a small study of that, which I way back presented uh, in the SNDT presentation. Um, and you will see that uh, the ways in which the women sanitation workers are facing the problem, because there's always been a contractual job given to this. And there's always been a threat that any time the post uh, you know, a lockdown uh, can actually take away their job. So, and also the wages have been reduced. So the survival, of course, of these women is caught in between the irregular and crisis even social, uh, social political conditions. And while taking an interview, I found that many of the women have this fear that losing the job as their major concern. So, uh, and uh, if you even further look at, you know, uh, this debate, in fact, in order to understand the reverse migration, it's the sanitation workers who have not been uh, 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 the reverse migration, but and one would see, in fact, uh, class caste uh, and gender debates in order to understand uh, these categories. Uh, at the hierarchy is the ways in which it is operating. So sanitation work, in fact, in fact, uh, you know, it is reproducing the stigma, caste-based occupation, exclusion based on caste identity. Thus, these forms of labor reproduce the stigma in a systematic fashion. Now, coming back to the uh, question that I wanted to raise is that what are the new challenges pandemic is going to go and open? I think that one of the significant uh, challenge, uh, I mean, uh, 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 when, yeah, uh, before that, you know, I just wanted to, in fact, uh, bring out this debate, uh, what Ambedkar also said, in order to understand, because the caste-based untouchability, because if we read uh, and look at Ambedkar's writing, Babasab is using, in fact, constantly the word untouchability in order to make you understand that how, uh, you know, these debates are there. And if we even look at uh, his work, Caste is in India, their mechanism, genesis and development, he, he says that caste is an enclosed car. And uh, caste is an enclosed class. And then uh, one would see that in the annihilation of the caste, he argued that caste is a notion, it is state of mind. And one would relate this debate what he said uh, in the pandemic, when one is looking at those categories very carefully, for instance, social distancing, caste, uh, language. Uh, and uh, I wanted to reflect a um, few uh, uh, you know, the challenges which I see in the pandemic. One is that the digital, uh, digitalization of the education in the context of the pandemic. And what kind of policies do we have? What kind of articulation the political institutions are doing in order to provide the online education to these communities? Um, and um, 
what are the ways in which because you know those who are privileged people their children can go they, they you know they, they can afford even immediately buying the new phones for their but uh, and as a reason you see that most of the marginal uh, you know community people or the children dalits particularly uh, they have been uh, out of the education system now um, before the pandemic if you look at even the figures of the primary schools it's more than 8 crore students which are out of the now the real question is that how we are going to go and look into this and uh, further if we go we, we see that very categorically that the suicide rate of the dalit girls uh, which is again from the so called developed state of kerala um, and also the punjab in response to the online education Uh, which makes us to rethink and revisit that how we are going to actually get into this debate and for the going to go um, and what kind of you know uh, ways in which one is going to go and um, you know find out the way uh, so there is a systematic uh, exclusion from the uh, in the field of education through accelerating the digital divide by the state itself also and exclusion uh, um, Uh, from the education and social distancing may remind them for the bunyas past grounded as caste ideology and practices uh, even in the context of the labor question which is a reverse migration um, if you remember uh, ambedkar's writing babas had very categorically said that um, educate educate um, and uh, in which that uh, and uh, he also suggested that uh, you know united and and uh, he also suggested that you know for instance uh, that you should leave the villages and come for uh, to the urban places in which you would not see the ways in which you would see the uh, i would say that the humiliation discrimination the forms of discrimination uh, the uh, you know the untouchability and um, and as a result that the first generation people who started uh, getting into education shifted to the urban places but eventually that many of the dalits who came from you know those rural areas and earning the money today when they went back if you take the interviews and their number of studies are out um, in which you would see that the clear reflection is there that um, even while they enter the you know in the own places um, they do not have any access to have the basic facilities of the life uh, and there is a tremendous discrimination in terms of also job the ways in which the crises are happening within uh, you know the low caste people not only dalit but the obeses and all if we look at the class wise divide then there is also been uh, uh, a picture which one can see that um, the jobs have been given to home and uh, one would see that as a result that women at, at the margin the dalit women workforce and uh, as uh, uh, vibhuti madam already said uh, about the you know domestic workers but then uh, this becomes again a crucial issue because uh, the ways in which in the cities and the rural area these issues have been operating because there's a, a, a huge migration which had happened uh, from rural india to the urban area and also the seasonal laborers or the seasonal uh, migrant workers this becomes again a very crucial question that how they are going to go in fact and deal with this locating themselves in the larger spaces and how one is going to go actually look at those debate in the new liberal economy now the question um, which i wanted to also raise is the right to dignity and uh, justice now if you look at the, the number of studies which are out um, and if you even look at for instance um, um, the public and the private pitch which is operating uh, in general if we see that there is a domestic wise dividing and um, if we see the variation of the patriarchy with, with dalit and non dalit women 
And there's a fantastic study which is out in the Watsuru in 2020. And I thank to Dilip Chavan for uh, making aware about and providing this material way back to read, uh, in which you would get categorically see that um, the articulation of the, uh, say, the Dalit woman and the non-Dalit woman. And if we draw the comparison and the forms of violence, one would see that uh, there is a difference. There's a huge difference in terms of the middle class, low caste, um, um, and also, uh, you know, uh, these variations are very much there. Within the middle class and low middle class Dalit families, the violence is very, very less. But uh, on the other hand, if we do the parallels with the non-Dalit woman in the same class, um, you would see that it's in, it's in huge. Uh, on the other hand, if we go to the rural India, where resources are not there, where Dalit uh, women themselves are liberal, where Dalit men themselves lost the job as liberal, the violence which is coming there, which never happened to many of those women, which is directly coming from the men because the poverty, the ways in which, because you know, um, if you if you in would be shocked to see that many of the even children uh, you know survive with water with barely and there's also been distribution when it was coming to the distribution of the resources like food the privileged upper caste people they did not allow the pastis to get those share and as a reason that there is also been a conflict when it comes to have the basic food like you know rice and dal and chawal these are the basic basic survival, uh, you know, this thing, groceries. So one has to see that that uh, that and how one is going to then further engage with that because uh, it's it's very clear to us that, and then uh, how one is going to go in fact and look at this whole humiliation during the pandemic and the question of dignity. We all of us knows the Hatras case. And I way back wrote a small piece in the EPW because I was furious with the many feminists which we are calling that there's no difference between the Nirbaya and the, you know, uh, uh, case and the Hatras case. And one would see that, uh, you know, uh, the difference, um, I mean, and, and this is coming again from gender or women's studies or the feminist group uh, that, uh, one should not bring out here the caste issue, rather one should see the rape as a crime. And I have a question actually here that then uh, I think that one, that one has to actually relook this debate again uh, in order to understand particularly, you know, the systemic violence and the structural violence because uh, the day by day it is increasing. And we should not also forget the Kalanji incidents in which that the 11 women also were part of this heinous crime of the Kalanji. So, uh, because, and, and if you look at, um, you know, there's a wonderful report which is out and Zuban has done a marketing. Uh, there's no lockdown to the uh, caste crimes. And if you look at that and read that, across the India, it's a horrific incidences like Khatras, which is, you know, where people had went, the NGO people went and activists went and did an intervention. And it's eventually after a long time, it appeared. No media, no social media, nothing actually reporting those. Because you know, again, it's that a very, very poor family members, girls have been brutally raped. I mean, uh, even in the quarantine center, uh, that they have been brutally raped and it's it happens cutting across and the, of course there's again been a regional variation as i said to you the suicide case in um, um, in um, kerala at the same time the most developed state which is you know the pandemics the ways in which handled i mean one is not doubting about that but the ways in which that the cases have been handled and there was a dalit girl who had been raped who was a 19 year old dalit girl was raped in the while she was taking uh, in the ambulance from one place to the other small village to the other place and she was in the middle of that she was raped now uh, it was uh, a major question and there was a lot of political articulation uh, happened but then uh, i do not see the 
anger which was there among the feminists because you know uh, these question needs to be again come up and we need to again revisit this and hatras is the best example where we see that where is the justice i mean eventually uh, that is again uh, keep coming to my mind that um, how do we actually going to go and ask and where we are going to go and ask the justice uh, as we know that democratic spaces also are shrinking um and i remember the 1991 gail has written one fantastic book uh, in which she argued that and it was about um, it was about the violence against women again it's a very tiny small book which she wrote and she's there she's articulating that how oh, in fact the globalization is going to go and change this capital small mode of production and then uh, the class caste relationship and today even if we even uh, relate this debate because hatra should not be also seen there is also interlinkages of the land distribution which is again reoccurring re and which has again the further linkages to the agrarian crisis which we are facing in across the india and the also the new bills so one has to also see uh, as you know palshikar uh, already pointed out this debate that uh, when one is looking at the agrarian crisis and the farmers issue one has to also look at that you know the dalits who are the landless laborer what they are going to go and get it so one way to look at also uh, those crises even in i mean one must appreciate also the young students articulating trying to preserve the you know democracy democratic values at the same time that how one is going to go and deal with because uh, you know sometimes i see that when people are talking about the agrarian crisis they just brought in the caste question and the dalits and i must say that uh, dalits are just a landless laborer even in punjab today and the atrocities and the forms are changing which one has to actually come and notice and uh, this is a time that we have to revisit this debate now coming back to the question that what feminists have done in the pandemic because i think the crucial issue which remains here is the uh, in order there are several issues which one can talk about but i think uh, one is the immediate issue which one has to look at reverse migration second is about the health issue um, health rights um, third is about the education uh, i mean there are number of issues uh and uh, when i'm talking about the health issues the first thing which came to my mind is that what had happened to the sex workers now dalit feminist have been debating this and there is um, um a sort of you know a disappointment and also uh, among some of them are the outright confront um, you know and the lit feminist says that we deny this choice and agency debate in order to understand because there are mainstream feminist and the lit feminist in fact way back offered a critique in 90s onwards that the class question class and gender was prime to them and central but caste was never been a question and those intersectionality approaches never actually uh, brought out by the mainstream feminists now i think it it's it's a time actually to revisit i have taken a few interviews of the uh, sex workers when the pandemic happened and the situation was very very pathetic there were few organization who came forward and provided the alternative jobs where they can survive but then the whole issue of the touch and untouch which again comes in here because when it is again the body of the dalit woman how it has been read interpreted and who is articulating their voices is again been a question who never gone through any uh, sort of trauma or those you know or that phases or those experiences so i think this is a time that one has to actually relook those debates particularly on the question of you know uh, reverse migration urban rural one has to also relook um you know the debates on the sex work and i would say that on the question of sex work i think that when the lit feminist keep keep claiming and um uttam kamle way back in fact uh, done a fantastic one in in order to 
um, uh, understand basically the Devdasya system and um, he led the movement way back in Maharashtra in 80s for a long period of time. And who are those Devdasis and eventually some of them become a sex worker. Now it comes basically that today pandemic has also given us a, a sort of uh, you know, a space where one can actually rethink about what happens to those women. Some of them do die with a hunger. What would happen in the future? Because the, the real issue of, again, the health crisis, which is again coming here, not only uh, uh, with the sex workers, but the, it's a larger Dalit woman, right? Whether they are doing the scavenging job, where they are migrant laborers, where you know uh, they keep doing uh, um, jobs, which they keep shuffling from one place to the other place. The second question, which I want to uh, spell out, is which I've been arguing, and if uh, Vibhuti and uh, Uma remembers in um, IAWS 2020, I said very categorically that online education is going to make you absolutely a political. And today you see that it's a huge number. The pandemic also is in one way. And also the certain ideology, they wanted to capture this nation state by propagating that. To some extent, they are becoming successful, but how we are going to go actually deal with that. Now, one of the, um, I mean, um, and um, when the Hathras happened, there was a Dalit Bahujan Manshit Adivasi group, which emerged and Swati Kamle, who lives in that broad, has taken an initiative and there were a good number of Dalit feminist Bahujan women, Manshit women, Adivasi women came together and formed. But there's also been a constant threat to them by the state. So, uh, and we all of us knows that how those, as I mentioned already, that how those you know democratic spaces are shrinking right to freedom and expression is also something which uh, we keep asserting but then also been uh, the ways in which you know the the state and the regime is operating um, and dealing with that so um, that was one of the way out which uh, when it emerged and that reminds me to the panthers contribution that um, unless we come together uh, because at one level, one would see that those very privileged academia, who is in fact today, uh, as Guru said that, you know, articulating Ambedkar is a fashionable discourse. In that way, you know, articulating caste and gender or the question of the Dalit women is also become a fashionable discourse rather, you know, putting into the practices, the both the things that, you know, the, the debate should emerge on this ethical questions that what we say we are sticking to that or not. And I think we have to go back because we have a rich tradition, critical tradition of Buddha, Kabir, Phule, Shahu, Ambedkar, uh, Periyar and cutting across, if we go and see that we have this tradition. So we need to strengthen and build that dialogue, but we have to have the concern about also how we are not only going to go and talk about foolish Ambedkar or the critical ideology or the dialogue, because this is a battle between the ideologies and the critical engagement. And how do we reestablish those? Uh, I think I would stop it here. Uh, thank you, Dr. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you gave a very, very powerful presentation very sharp a well documented presentation and touched upon so many important concerns right from genealogy of social distancing declaiming social practice uh, reactionary social practices which have now proliferated throughout the country uh, relationship of caste patriarchy and also uh, historical learnings from the uh, epidemic of plague and the role of satya shodhak uh, movement uh, and uh, savitri bai phule and her son and also the question of untouchability in the question uh, in serving food and also untouchability being practiced in the COVID center containment zone. And uh, currently Oxfam released its reports just six days back, inequality report. I think that also corroborates, it's based on a survey of 
eight uh, states and that also the ground level reality corroborates what you 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 told us i am also a member of a jury for a janason y of safai karmachari sangatna where manual scavengers currently 4000 documented manual scavengers uh, who are forced to do to deal with the uh, with bare hand without any support uh, of any any personal protection uh, they are forced to handle the dead bodies which are flown in the rivers they are dead animals and also the kind of human excreta there are no sanitary toilets anywhere and what they get is not monetary wages as you said correctly none of the state support or the even pds ration kit is reaching them they are only given the leftover food by the savannas so i think this is a very very stark reality we are facing and especially the case sex workers uh, uh, right i think everywhere both in the major cities like mumbai also it has happened and now i come to dr uma chakravarti who is also a very important uh, feminist activist in our country and she has done a lot of ground level work and over to dr so um, thank you thank you for uh, uh, having me here as a discussant uh, smita's um, presentation has been so wide ranging i mean it's like uh, it's almost like she had a dam sitting inside her and it burst and i can see that uh, it is the it's actually the the pandemic has exacerbated it's actually uh manifold um increased the uh, sense of uh, uh uh violence and uh, um you know the whole stigmatization and the violence and so on which uh, is is bad enough in its running situation and it's uh, so reprehensible and you know uh, but in the pandemic it's actually become that much more visible because it is um uh, visible in the sense that if only if you can see it a, a lot of people will not even see it because it will be see, treated as part of the regular uh, way in which the stigma has operated but uh, what um, smita has done is to actually point to the uh, structural features which have uh, been dramatically enhanced in the time of the uh, pandemic in strange ways so you may not even notice it but you need to notice it because it is uh, uh, it's uh, along the thread line the along, <clears throat> along the line of discrimination and touch and dignity and so on and i think <clears throat> i let me just uh, quickly state one point before i move to the others i think she ended with a very powerful plea and i see that as really the the sal perhaps that's the that's the way we might be able to all um learn something positive uh, get out uh, think afresh uh, she said she said um it's not questions that are fashionable that are important uh, and that's really so important you know it is true uh, it's very trendy it's very nice at the moment to talk about um intersectionality to talk about you know rights and so on but Uh, fundamentally it's an ethical question and her flagging that to my mind is the most important thing that she said today ethic ethicality is actually at the heart of everything that we see as the crisis today and whether you start with you know what uh, as she did his you know step by step she went from um the uh, reverse migration and so on you you can see that actually uh, it, it uh where was the display of where was the sensitivity to ethics even in a time of death and crisis absolutely none absolutely none it was just like erased completely uh, in fact ethics has been thrown into the dustbin and in its place you have rhetoric and you know all sorts of lies and whatever it is so i i think that to that extent i, I it's the range that um, smita has brought to the table today uh, which will actually make it very difficult to even have uh, uh, say tease out the elements which are uh, which are say central to the argument uh, that she is making because the argument itself is um, uh, so wide ranging i mean the issues that she's flagged are so wide ranging so i would uh, be begin with you know this first point that she makes about the 
uh, she she also highlighted, and for me also historically, and it's historically that is true. Uh, it was the reverse migration that made us suddenly and dramatically aware of the crisis of uh, uh, the pandemic as it is going to unfold in the lives of the majority of our uh, laboring people. So let's you know at the heart of it is people who labor, and uh, it is they who. Uh, upon and labor and do a pa be part of unorganized labor, living under terrible uh, conditions of existence in terms of <clears throat> housing and 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 the and the uh, uh, and first to lose their work. I mean, so when there's an economic crisis, the first thing that happens is this is the segment that loses its work. So in a sense, I think, uh, and she brought it up. Um, Smita brought it up later on. She mentioned the Dalits. I, I want to return to the, um, for us to think about this, the, the Dalit Panther, she mentioned the Dalit Panthers, and I think we need to return to the Dalit Panthers in terms of their, their um, moment of when they burst on the scene and the anger with which they burst on the scene uh, with uh, uh, how they formulate who is, you know, uh, now, it's, now we say it's Dalit Bahujan, um, uh, one chit, very, very nice term that one chit, those who are excluded, those who are uh, actually the Dalit Panthers description of who is a Dalit uh, uh, is all encompassing in that sense of the term. That is all the sections that are, have been historically uh, and systematically abused and marginalized in, uh, in, um, uh, uh, in, in our society and the, uh, and the ones who are actually feeling the anger and I think since we're going to come to the moment of independent uh, celebration, uh, let's remember that they, they actually burst on the scene around uh, 25 years after the uh, uh, India became independent. And the, the, it's the force with which they threw that in the street, which is to say, uh, whose independence, why should we celebrate anything at all? Actually, this is a, uh, uh, this, this is a situation where, uh, Nothing has changed. If anything, it's gotten worse. So, in a sense, the uh, the anger explodes as uh, what are we celebrating? Because there is nothing to celebrate. And I think that they, at the end of the pandemic, it's likely that we will actually have to uh, say precisely the same thing. Because if, if anything, it's that much uh, worse. And I think in the point that um, um, was there uh, um, true, so who who. In the images, also, you see the fleeing labor as they return uh, back. And why do they go home? Because uh, in a sense, it's, they're claiming at least the autonomy to die uh, or to go away from a place where they've been so badly exploited, even though they might come back three months, six months later. But whatever it is, they, uh, this, and in that, the visual images that, you remain, that remain are the ones of women. And you see that quite powerfully because uh, um, you know, there's an there's a old woman being carried by her grand, her son uh, because she, uh, she cannot walk. There is the um, a woman pulling the suitcase and the child sleeping on it. And there is the uh, terrible um, uh, account of the woman who died in the train and was taken off. And they are completely, uh, in my classification, they are very much there. Muslim, uh, Bahujan, Vanchit uh, groups of people. So the, in imagery, you see this, but we don't really know what their stories are, you know, anything else about them and what led them to make the decisions that they did to go the way they did. So I think that that crisis was a major crisis and the, the newspapers may have covered it very well, but I, then it dropped out. Actually, you didn't read, uh, uh, it didn't go to anything more seriously, um, you know, uh, sustained in uh, our critique of, uh, of whatever. And you contrast that with the, the uh, concern that immediately started to surface on the lockdown, which is that violence within, and this was coming from middle class homes, violence within the home is going to increase because the men are now stuck inside the house and there will be an escalation of violence. It's interesting that that is the first time that they see the violence, um, Escalating, and it is to do with you know at the end of the day the the theory, the touch non-touch and the world outside and the world at home locked in 
is all linked together in a in a in a critical way and uh, that's the concern that comes up you know when uh, uh, people are writing and there is um, this sort of policy being thought of from uh, helplines being con considered and so on and at the same time as um, uh, as uh, has been uh, flagged by smita and uh, so uh, uh, now both known and perhaps not well known enough is the hatras that is the right to be touched uh, the the whole discussion around touch which for some years now has been quite interesting in um, um, in uh, uh, discussions uh, around uh, around questions of caste the uh, here the in hatras in the middle of this pandemic which is like a double thing there is not only there uh, the caste question and the so-called you we don't touch. I mean, you let's remember the uh, infamous statement of uh, the judge in the Bhavari case that is that upper caste men cannot rape a, a, a Dalit woman because uh, you know uh, it's there's a question of the touch. So and yet actually this is the uh, this is the moment which explodes and uh, you know and Hatras is not by itself because if you look at the Dalit media statistics and the discussions I mean on a routine basis they're talking about what is happening in the countryside as far as uh, sexual violence is concerned so actually sexual violence and along with that if you link up uh, Smita's uh, flagging of the point about what happens to the sex workers of whom a large number may actually be from Dalit households and therefore you cannot endorse. I mean, the whole discussion that Dalit feminists have had with others, which is that you can't, we cannot uh, valorize the choice in sex work because in reality, the, uh, the concern is of uh, uh, the, the, uh, the real life uh, is so marked by the question of, uh, of uh, caste. So in that sense also, I think it's, it's important, uh, Hatras, right to be touched and yet, you know, of course, uh, you know, the way in which it is articulated. But let's also remember one thing, the panic that set in, and I only take comfort from that, the panic that set in over Hatras was unique. And to an extent, it's an extended story from Kerlanji because you see that the UP government actually hired uh, international, uh, an international media group to uh, create, uh, rewrite the, uh, the, uh, the news that was circulating. So you can see that kind of panic. And I think it's important to sustain that critique that um, Dalit feminists have put. And uh, to some extent, yes, hopefully, uh, I would say other feminists who are sensitive to the caste question have placed on the, on, the, on the map. So I think that's really very important. I'll just, uh, there's a lot that I could say uh, but I just stop with uh, one other uh, point, which is um, I, I really liked what um, uh, Smita you did with the um, with the question of the history and the history of hospitalization and um, and uh, reminding us that in that unwritten history of Savitri Bai Phule, I mean, you know how how comprehensive her work was. We don't even know fully. I mean, you have to find uh, each, each of these adds to our understanding of her. But that she, the plague is a time when she's actually active and her son and she are out there saving lives. And it is a time, and plague is also really about touch. The panic that sets in in, in plague is exactly like that. And I would like to just uh, also say that at that point of time, interestingly, even some of the uh, non Bahujan women, even women who may have begun as upper caste women like Ramabai and, um, and uh, Lakshmi Bhai Tilak. Lakshmi Bhai Tilak is extraordinary because she brings home from the plague uh, camp, she brings home a, so many little girls who have been abandoned, the little Dalit girls who've been abandoned at the time of the plague. And uh, even um, so, actually, the, we have a rich history that we can go back to in terms of intervention and thinking about, uh, about um, the monstrosity of uh, uh, caste and the question of touch and non-touch. So the whole debate around you know, social distancing, physical distance 
it they, people don't even pay any attention to that history you know at the end of the day we have that history so what, the term itself how anyone could have used it at any point of time i think it's quite uh, um it's quite um outrageous so i'll just stop at that because i think um there's many things and i'm the, everybody must have time to ask their question so uh, uh if you yeah th you. thanks smita for the range of questions that you opened up thank you dr mach chakravarti <clears throat> for highlighting the ethicality and yeah. and also enriching the discourse by bringing your critical reflection on <coughs> reverse migration also the critical reflection on violence domestic violence and the middle class bias and also the discourse on plague and also monstr monstrosity of caste now we turn to dr jay gurvarti would you like to please respond yeah thanks uh, professor patel uh, <clears throat> thanks to smita for this uh, uh, bringing in a very important uh, you know question of uh, the social uh into uh, what now is it the debate is turning into of uh, more universal registers that the pandemic kind of impacts everyone across caste and class everyone is equally vulnerable to the pandemic because the virus itself does not you uh, know socially discriminate uh and then they are also moving towards more planetary uh, histories uh, deepesh's recent work uh, talks about on more universal registers that we are into an integrated world Uh, the ecology question that has come up is also brought in brought back that uh, kind of a planetary global history uh, your work i think what you presented today does very important thing of uh, reminding us that uh, uh, there is that social is not breached those social hierarchies those social forms of discrimination the way we have known uh, you know historically uh, somewhere Uh, uh in terms of the way we are framing questions has become a certain kind of an invisibility has uh, taken over so i think one a theoretical mode i was really thinking that one can uh, really kind of reframe what all you have said is this question of uh, modernity and invisibility that uh, no that uh, there is a certain sense of invisibility that has come to these social questions and we'll have to kind of pause and see how this invisibilization uh is being now mobilized by the ruling elite uh that uh, that it has become part of policy making it has become part of development talk it has pa become part of ecological uh, question it has become part of planetary and global history all of this uh, are somewhere grounded around uh, certain invisibilization of social discrimination and uh, my hunch uh is you refer you did say to capitalism and neoliberalism but my hunch smita is that uh, this uh, process of invisibilization has something to do with the development uh, question that uh, the development narrative uh, has brought in uh, a certain kind of a development imagination uh, you know uh, which is very urban which is considered very progressive which is considered very fast paced Uh, which is kind of uh, which kind of as uh, overrun or displays the old kind of debate on caste gender domestic spaces you know these all now look like very old kind of questions which have uh, no relevance uh, so i think this development imagination that has been uh, that has come about in the last 20 30 odd years i think has also afflicted the academic uh, spaces uh, the way academia is now posing and that's where i think your reminder is very important that old forms of hierarchy old forms of uh, discrimination in terms of untouchability in terms of physical violence uh, very much exist and that modernity uh, far from kind of resolving them uh, is complicating them in terms of providing this invisible uh, no I, i i was reminded when i heard you and also read your epw piece of uh, uh, p sinat uh, no coverage if you remember on what it called the glass war uh, he did a survey in the rural hinterlands of uh, andhra pradesh and in south india till tamil nadu where he said that uh, this that uh, the wayside uh, uh, dhabas or hotels on the highways uh, used to practice a do two glass policy one for the upper caste customers and one for the uh, so called lower caste uh, customers and when there were protests <coughs> against this two glass uh, policy Uh, by the dalit uh, uh, and and the other uh, no uh, uh, 
lower end caste group uh, they brought in what was called the plastic glasses the disposable you know this disposable glasses uh, poses a very interesting problem a very intriguing problem that it allows for a semblance for optics of equality uh, for non discrimination being practiced at the surface level but one can carry one's prejudices uh, as you go along because you don't have to share the same glass uh, with your non caste uh, uh, hindus so i think this invisibilization is a very important uh, question that modernity is uh, kind of uh, the way it's addressing uh, uh, this problem of uh, social discrimination and prejudice i think the recent pew survey uh, also brought in this idea on the religious front that uh, people enjoy diversity but uh, people want the segregation that uh, what zizek you know you have referred to zizek in your piece i think the other important piece that he read, uh, wrote was this on multiculturalism or the uh, logic of uh, our cultural logic of uh, multinational where he makes this point about multiculturalism how it is uh, different by distance uh, different as distance he says that this idea of distance this idea of segregation of uh, communities uh, no uh, uh, much of europe has as a as, as a result of uh, multiculturalism again i think is a similar question of uh, uh, no segregation the question of uh, what you thought social distancing that uh, uh, this is now a kind of a legitimized uh, segregation so this is a kind of a uh, 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 it's a kind of a discrimination where it is becoming increasingly difficult to verbalize the discrimination so one the good example is this once you have disposable glasses uh, people who carry caste prejudices uh, then cannot that prejudice cannot be verbalized that becomes you know increasingly uh, invisible i think this is somewhat new space is the way uh, modernity is pushing which again you have very rightly referred in terms of uh, uh, the digital divide that this entire new economic policy uh, that is uh, brought about if one reads the document uh, you know uh, uh, between the lines uh, one can very clearly see how uh, this whole idea of drop out you know as a choice so choice is being used as a legitimizing factor to reinforce already existing caste and class hierarchy that you give students a uh, uh, chance to drop out at 8th standard 10th standard 12th standard and you argue that this is a great liberal uh, document uh, because it gives multiple opportunities even it is saying that you know graduation you have four years somebody can drop out at uh, second year and take a, a certificate and third year a degree so, you know all kinds of options are being offered uh, uh, into to reinforce uh, caste and class uh, differences in fact the telangana government one of the policies was to fund there was a very interesting debate that happened in telangana where the uh, trs government started funding caste based occupations uh, uh, and the uh, chief minister went public saying that there are not enough government jobs everybody cannot be accommodated into private sector so he said that why not modernize caste based occupation so he started funding he said he has the barber uh, to make their saloons more modern instead of sitting under a tree uh, he gave funding for uh, blacksmith so on and so forth so this led to very interesting debate that what uh, uh, no, uh, no something that reminds of the debate on gandhi that when gandhi said scavenging also can be a spiritual uh, function the key question there was about choice so choice on one hand is being used to reinforce social hierarchies uh, and choice is being used to actually reinforce lack of choice so this fungibility of language uh, this this uh, through invisibilizing the question i think poses a really a new challenge and i would urge that your work i think you should push uh, in that direction that uh, especially you are working in ignore distance education so now distance education that idea of that distance uh, is something that we need to problematize now what is this distance we were told 50 years 40 years back that distance education was a democratic experiment it is about uh, uh, you know opportunity for people who had to uh, go back to jobs early on to kind of have higher education which might be true might, maybe it did that good but today in this a uh, complicated context that we are in uh, where you have this digital divide you know in telangana yesterday some dalit groups distributed mobiles uh, 
so again that question that you raise now now is this the education that we are envisaging that you know that you know as you said it leads to kind of depoliticization you are uh, thinking of education without campus life you are thinking of education without where heterogeneous social groups come together you know abhijit benerji or recent nobel laureate he said the thing he learned in jnu the most was that there are heterogeneous social groups with different imagination which he said he did not learn when he was at presidency so this removal of campus life precisely in the name of democratization that uh, now they are saying that you don't need all this investment on campus and all this higher education just give them a mobile and even a dalit sitting in a, in, in a far off place uh, can have best of the lectures from a delhi university and uh, and jain this is what they are uh, telling us but what this does uh, is again a very invisible question and i think those of us on the progressive democratic whatever one would like to call ourselves uh, I, i think are struggling to articulate this process of invisibilization of the social question that modernity uh, is pushing in terms of big development uh, in terms of inclusivity they are, so they are also using similar language that they are saying that digital you know education would uh, make it very inclusive that everybody now can envisage uh, uh, higher education uh, which i mean again as we know uh, there is a digital divide but they might tomorrow promise uh, let's assume uh, full connectivity and uh, uh, no inter of fellowships and all that they say we will distribute mobile phones for free maybe even laptops for free uh, already many governments are doing that nitish kumar government did that mamta banerjee did that in uh, bengal uh, giving free laptop to young Dal uh, dalit girls young girls of other caste too uh, you know, uh, it happened in uttar pradesh akhilesh uh, did that uh, what is the social consequence of this i mean on the on up front it looks like a very progressive move that the, uh, the the those who have been discriminated are now ending up with modern technology which might be the attractive part of it that they get in one way connected but then they get invisibilized in in another sense so this so therefore i think you are you brought in very important question of distance i think today we need to really theorize on this aspect of distance which are which is happening as i suggested in multiple ways this idea of the distance is coming back uh, and and the hunch with the anxiety that many of us really have is that this this the way the distance is being mobilized is to precisely reinforce uh, existing social hierarchies is to sharpen uh, a very polarized kind of differences there are differences no doubt and differences cannot be erased but there is a kind of polarization of those differences and hierarchy uh, and fraternity you know the kind idea of fraternity is especially the right hindutva is bringing is a kind of a hierarchical uh, fraternity it is fraternity no doubt you know one thing that ambedkar said was that fraternity is one principle uh, which cannot be a constitutional principle you know you cannot build fraternity through constitutionalism or constitutional morality you have to build fraternity on the ground and uh, that's what i think i see your paper as hinting towards that Uh, but i would urge that i think uh, uh, you need to really push that beyond that what do we do you did mention in terms of fraternity and solidarity i think that where we all uh, agree that we need to push but i think the challenges for that uh, really is in terms of where our language seems to be struggling uh, to communicate uh, is that this invisibilization uh, this where discrimination itself Uh, is looking therefore the, the migrant question that you raised was very important many people did not respond because many did not understand that the migrant question the way power exists on ground uh, is pretty much something has not changed at all the nature of violence hatras i think that way was the reminder that you know this kind of violence that we thought was now perhaps a passe even in rural india because mobile have reached uh, modern roads have reached uh, modern buildings have come but do you see that that uh, as again ambedkar reminded caste is essentially a question of habit it's a state of mind uh, and therefore for to to uh, this modern in, in that sense modernity perhaps is blocking that change of uh, state of mind uh, this uh, uh, our earlier understanding of modernity was that it would perhaps change the way we think but uh, it is somewhere blocking that inherent prejudices and the modern development is providing an alibi an excuse Uh, a justification silent justification and that silencing distancing invisibilization for me is the big take away from your uh, paper so i will stop here and thank you once again for uh, this uh, very important uh, presentation yes.
Thank you, Dr. Ajay, for bringing out a very important uh, insight about uh, in, uh, invisibility and discrimination and also giving a very apt example of a two glass uh, policy of Dabas replaced by disposable uh, glasses and how it invisibilizes your other example of how the children who are forced out are considered in official discourse as a dropout and also the question of the way the language is being used by the dominant forces uh, which doesn't capture any kind of uh, actual ground reality and uh, even your unpacking of fraternity and uh, uh, solidarity I think that is also very insightful now we have two very important questions uh, one is by uh, Dr. Soma Chaudhary Lahiri, where she says that I am interested in responses from the organized social movements to this COVID-19 pandemic and was there a dialogue between women's movement and Dalit groups or the movement or were there attempts by Dalit groups to offer a critique? And the second equally important question is by Dr. Nagmani Rao, who is also very active in the uh, people's movement and social movement in Maharashtra. She asked, during the pandemic, activists, intellectuals, and journalists have been arrested under the trumped up sedition charges and online campaigns and social media discussions. And some amount of public uh, uh, demonstrations have raised their voices against this. But to me here also, it seems like the intensity and continuity of the responses have reflected uh, caste class uh, biases and locational differences. What are your observations on this? I think this question, all three of you can answer. So first, uh, Smita, would you like to? Um, I think that uh, one thing which I should very categorically and specifically say that um, in the pandemic, what my observation is about the social movement and the feminist movement is that these compartments become more sharp. You know, the OBC Women's Organization, the Dalit Women's Organization, at the same time, um, as you know, I have mentioned about Dalit Bahujan Vanchit group, you know, so one would see that at the same time, it is sharpening those compartment at a separate level, because, you know, there are common questions within them. And there's also been, there are some tensions and differences when it comes to the resource distribution um, and many other issues. So I think that, you know, it's, uh, I see that, you know, uh, rather than uh, bringing out the separate con compartment and keep claiming, I think if it is a collective effort and that too, my take is very clear that someone who is, as I mentioned also, uh, quoting Gopal Guru uh, in one of his talk of the EPW where he said very categorically that Ambedkar's discourse become very fashionable in that way uh, the feminist discourse also in order to bring out caste, gender, the question of Dalit women, Bahujan women, it also becomes a very fashionable discourse and particularly caste and gender rather than, you know, uh, bringing, because I do not see the, that that gap is bridging. Rather, you know, I see that the gap between the um, academician and activist and Uma and um, you know, Vibhuti will agree with me because 70s, 80s, 90s, that in Maharashtra and other parts of India, we used to have, uh, you know, the classes. We used to have the classes of the, uh, you know, to understand what capitalism means, what Dalit means. So I think we need to go back to that old model in what way one is going to go and do that. Because that is something, because see, I see that every moment as, Buddha says that every moment we are changing, but the challenges which are coming today from the current regime is, is that every fraction of second, every moment, because the moment, one moment you are actually something is coming, you are thinking about what kind of the solution, the second incident is coming. So you have been totally engaged into that. So and I think this is something which we have to work very, very seriously, very critically and bridging, bridging those gaps. That's why uh, I concluded. I wanted to also mention that uh, here, um, you know, when the first pandemic happened um, and I'm translating this message for the larger audience again, uh, 
one of the family went from the obc community from maharashtra to the own village and this is a person writing to me uh, i'm not putting the name because i was told that not to quote the name uh, we have been doing the caste discrimination um, you know from the ages my family must have done my forefathers must have done right to all of you when i have been quarantined in the school for 14 days along with my family was segregated in separate rooms i realize what crime we have done i think this is also been a time to look at and to rule you know to visit oneself what one has done right one is not expecting that but you know when question comes because dalit themselves are so vulnerable so i think also as amit could also pointed out that you know very categorically that it it is not something one person you have to come and we have to go back and we have to also see that how baba said organize the moment i would say that in fact it's a huge number of the people from the you know privileged caste and community who came together who, who were part of that moment when they accepted him as a leader so i think we have to have the constant dialogue and we need to spell out region wise the variation and the problems because it varies from place to place right and um, you know i mean the ways in which in the during the lockdown also the atrocity is happening you know the intercaste marriage which used to be so common when vibhuti got married uh, it used to be so common in maharashtra but today it is becoming very difficult it's 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 very difficult to have the you know the hindu muslim marriage or you know the brahmins marrying to this thing um and uh, so the first question is that and i think the second question is that uh, i mean my answer to all three question would be this only that we have to have and we have to have the strategies to you know to to look for the alternative model and how we are going to actually save the democratic spaces because we need to go back to the field and do very meticulous work it's not only just sitting here and giving lectures because we have to go back you know whatever critical situation may be and uh, there are few people who are trying to do you know um, sort of experiments within maharashtra and i'm sure that it might be this uh, model might be worked out in rest of that the cooperative societies the ways in which it is trying to rebuild again to to bring out the livelihood for the people at least they can able to sustain and i think um, uh, in my understanding the women have the capacity to do that because the ways in which they can engage they can understand the plight uh because even today that uh, you know uh the family still uh, that you know the male member who will be the patriarchal but it's uh, the rest of the thing is completely managed by the woman so uh, i see that one of the way now my only worry is that how we are going to go and uh, i somehow uh, you know propose that um we have to go to old model keeping this spirit of the anti caste movement because uh, we have also seen what this regime has done to the ngos and when you are totally depend on the funds and money it actually kills your spirit to do any sort of work well dr uma chakravarti you have been a veteran in the women's movement and human rights movement for over four decades and i remember asking you a question when you came for radha gandhi memorial lecture that how can we survive this today's wave you know of a cultural nationalism and total intolerance and you told me ibuti i am an eternal optimist and if we could survive emergency rule those horrible days we can survive anything so i would like to know your response and especially the your response on the uh, response of the social movements in the current times yeah <laughs> well um i think that even in my own <clears throat> recent years i have had more reason to be depressed than i was at that stage because i don't really see uh <clears throat> there's a particular way in which the 
uh, see, there was very little civil society support for the emergency uh, because there was such a large number of people who were put into jail. Um, and it, was, it went from, there were lots of middle-class people who went into jail. And so there were a number of <clears throat> people who were affected. So when the emergency ended, there was a sort of reaction. Now, uh, the tragedy is that we don't have a formal emergency. We have a silent emergency. And uh, that has, and plus we have this horrendous situation of uh, uh, consent for uh, the right-wing state. You know, there's a, a expanded consent for the right-wing state. To some extent, that's begun to erode with the, uh, with the handling of the pandemic. And, um, you know, you, it is interesting that we know, not, nobody mentioned it, but it is actually the uh, questions of oxygen and its unavailability and the burials and so on that has created an outrage, not some of the issues that got flagged today, you know, I mean, like uh, uh, some of the issues that we raised. Those, of course, are horrible and there's no doubt about it. <clears throat> but the fact of the matter is that now there's a, some little uh, stirring is, is happening. Um, some stirring is also happening with uh, people like Stan Swami. We, let's, let's consider that uh, Stan Swami is also standing with the Vanchit groups. Huh? So the very category that, um, uh, that uh, uh, Smita flagged today, they, and working for the Vanchit groups is being particularly targeted because the Vanchit groups have to be controlled in a certain kind of way by the state. So in a sense, what you're seeing is that the progressive possibilities of building alliances and um, and uh, on an ethical ground, uh, I'll, I'll re uh, reinforce that. To some extent, that is being, uh, it's, it's, uh, um, it's being qualified or it's being dented. Uh, but equally, there's so much anger now uh, on, you know, I mean, it's, it's tragic that Father Stan Swami had to die before, you know, this uh, kind of reaction came. Um, so at the end of the day, I think questions of ethics I, I really think that that's where we should go. That's the direction we have to go. Build the movements based on ethics. And if you do, then you might be able to make cross-cutting alliances of various kinds. You know, we, th those are uh, positive things. So I would actually say that the young standing and taking on some of the uh, repressive issues of the state, uh, very vibrant, I think, critical um, Dalit Bahujan movement, uh, which is raising questions and Dalit feminist uh, questions, which will keep people on their toes. So that's the important thing. You know, it will actually uh, demand accountability. Uh, so perhaps we are at a moment where we might be able to see forward move in a way in which we could uh, return to, a, uh, to, to envisage a society which does not have this horrendous form of inequality. I mean, I think there's an evil genius that worked in India to create this monstrous caste system. I don't think there's any system like that anywhere in the world. And, but it requires a great deal of um, uh, political commitment and ethics to change that. And I think we need to bring ourselves together uh, to, to try and do that, you know, I, I put it into our framework all the time, all the time, yeah. And we must remember that why after all, the Bhima Koregaon issue is actually something that is about the contested nature of the, uh, of the uh, Dalit, possibilities of a Dalit assertion, which could actually be very powerful uh, at this point of time. So in that sense, it's both depressing, but it also tells us that there are possibilities for change. Uh, I don't think that those have been foreclosed. And no. it is, for it, Bhima Koreka, even the global solidarity is emerging. Yes. No, and I, I think that, you know, I mean, if we have more discussions like this and more ways in which we can return to the spirit of the um, critical, critical engagement with all institutions, Kavi na kavi to hamare bhi din aayenge. Thank you. That is really gives us hope. Now, Dr. Absolutely Adair, right to me. Yeah. Yeah, I think we are all on the same page in terms of forging larger solidarities. But I think the context has uh, 
substantially changed uh, post neoliberalism i think uh, 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 it has got more complex that i think so now we are into an aspirational age uh, where i think again this development talk has uh, induced a kind of an aspiration new aspiration faster mobility among uh, all groups including dalit bahujan uh, one chit group and um, i think one uh, uh, you know one one way to read is actually democratization of the last a uh, few decades of dalit bahujan politics as itself kind of complicated things for dalit bahujan politics because that complication has led to where in terms of imagination we are imagining more dignified uh, relations more mutual mutually respectful but materially uh, things have not transformed and that's where my critique of dalit bahujan politics has been that it has been more on the cultural front in terms of identity dignity uh, and representation but that hard hitting critique of capitalism neoliberalism uh, privatization of capital spaces i think has been missing uh, on the dalit uh, mobilization front uh, and it was refreshing to hear uh, uh, smita uh, begin with neoliberalism and uh, capitalism i think th that uh, that that delinking that has happened in much of the uh, 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 social movement uh, you no know, uh, critique uh, i think today we are seeing the consequence of that that uh, it has on one hand the dalit bahujan politics contributed to kind of uh, uh, breaking down of the old patron client relation i think that has been the single most important contribution that uh, dalit bahujan politics made in terms of sheer imagination today uh, we are in a post patronage era that you know you talk to anyone on the street you will realize that uh, uh, people don't take uh, talking them down uh, you know you might have those caste and class inequalities structurally in place but sure uh, mutuality as a principle i think we have to some extent uh, you know established and you can find that in every kind of public interaction but materially people have not uh, been able to realize those conditions to actualize that democratic image i think this gap between these two uh, is the new challenge that uh, social movements are, are really facing and that's where i think we need a new language how do we accommodate this aspirational uh, language uh, and how do we create those material conditions i think there has to be now discussion in terms of the sheer materiality of uh, no we have a long cultural discursive kind of uh, uh, articulation now is the time to really discuss what are those forms material forms are we really talking about property redistribution are we really talking about common school education system i think these are the debates that are missing from even the most radical of uh, social movements i think we we'll have to bring go back to those large social demands you know i think free and compulsory uh, education, education for all a uh, free and compulsory health for all uh, you know uh, maybe certain forms of property redistribution is land reform a relevant question i think these are the questions we we'll have to get back to debate to create those social material conditions that can match up to the discursive imagination we have present to that extent our democracy has been a success i think dalit bahujan mobilization has been a success where it has kind of failed faltered is on the material question but i think, uh, I think what we saw in bima korega these are the people who were also trying to bring both the issues together and those who do this they are called either urban naxals or maoists no so that also has happened but still yeah. we have a person like shambhaji bhagat who is shy he tries to connect both the caste uh, based operation and also the neoliberal this thing now there are two very important questions one by dr nagmani rao can you unmute her it is about education and second one is by dr victor banerji so one after another can you uh, unmute them impri team please unmute dr nagmani rao is nagmani there we are doing that yes yes nagmani ma'am has joined yeah. can okay. you hear us yeah dr rao Yes, can you hear me? We yeah. can hear you, ma'am. If you can also have your camera on. Um, no issues. Yeah, yeah. yeah you're no, not no, ready. Can. Please, ma'am. No, no, no. I can. No problem. Yeah. yeah. Um. Yeah. Basically, you know, the uh, I found the whole um, linkage between the digitalization of education, also leading likely to lead to a lot of distance mode education. and therefore the kind of direct contact education which also creates the scope for you to get together get organized i think uh, i 
not quite looked at it, but uh, what Dr. Smita Patil, as well as uh, Dr. Uma Chakravarti and uh, Dr. Ajay Guduvati uh, brought out, is this is a very important point uh, that the three of you together have raised, that the NEP has got this huge focus on digitalization. And uh, when we as a social movement talk about uh, you know, deprivation, denial, exclusion, suicides, etc., cetera, et cetera, the state response will be, okay, so we'll make it accessible. And of course, Ambani is there to provide all the networks. Uh, so that's, that's a win-win situation, isn't it? All around. But then we also need to understand that a lot of uh, angst, whether it was the 70s or 80s, uh, and even now in the 21st century in the last some years has come through campus organizing. And uh, um, two things I want to flag here. One is of course, picking up youth in a big way under sedition charges, whether it is Disha Ravi or anybody else and journalists, all this is happening. So there's, there's a clear movement to suppress youth voices which are rising uh, in, in a big way right now after a lull after the post 90s you know and we are seeing this happening at least in a section it's still not as widespread as it was in the post emergency era when many of us entered uh, the social movement so this kind of a sinister design that you people have brought out so well uh, the question is as a social movement how adequately uh, equipped are we to really expose this design to the common people? Because otherwise we are getting increasingly marginalized. Whatever the state does, we criticize, but what are the alternatives? So unless we talk about alternatives, at the same time, understanding how we can Channelized digital, we are all, I mean, in the 80s, all of us spoke against <laughs> computers, digitalization, and so on. And now today, we are all hooked to it and using it, in fact. So, so this kind of a thing, how do we channelize it while at the same time exposing it? Uh, that's my question. Thank you. And uh, yeah, uh, Dr. Victor, Victor, uh, Victor Banerjee, your question is also on a similar line. So I think both can be answered. So can you also make your presentation? You have also asked about the digitalization and the international companies, service providers. Um, can I answer this? Yes, but I think let him also complete, then all three of you can answer. Yeah. Ma'am, Victor sir has not been able to join. Okay, he, then no, no, we, no, have, yeah, we, have, can, we can read his question. What, yeah. He has written in a chat that with 35% uh, of major Indian population are debarred from digital inclusivity uh, with the pernicious process of capitalism of internet giants changing money as basic plan, which is often unaffordable. Shouldn't we question this uh, self-made hypocrisy? Ma'am, we also have Rakesh Gangulji. He has also asked a few questions on chat box. Okay. Can yeah. we answer this? And yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yes. yes. Uh, I think that uh, for me, this digital divide, and if you read between the line, the NEP document, I think it is reinforcing you, the slavery system and the caste system. If you read between the line very carefully, 498 pages when it was uploaded for the remarks by the government of India and then came out with 2025 pages as a big policy. So uh, if you read the document which was uploaded 2019 uh, in the public space to show that how, you know, we do believe on democratic spaces providing the citizen for their say, right? So I think that this is something which we have to go further and talked about the mental health of the teacher and the student, how it is going to go and impact. We have to find out alternatives. And I must tell you now, most recently, before this minister joined, 36 universities in India have been given a permission to launch yeah. the programs and courses in distance education. Yeah. And you know, people have been dying actually 
to get into that. People are asking me that, could you help me, uh, blah, blah, blah. Now, the real question is that uh, we have to go back. Uh, it's, it's, it's not only that we have to right now only stop here. We need to go back to the National Knowledge Commission, Sam Pitruda, that how it traveled and where we caught up. Uh, in my understanding, we can actually defend this, um, that, you know, uh, how it is actually this whole pedagogy, the teaching learning processes are going to damage and what kind of citizens we are going to critic, uh, create, basically. Uh, one of the ways in which the uh, regime is trying to, you know, bring out this back is that those critical minds, those uh, students, when we interact actually in the face-to-face -face or the conventional teaching, we can actually, you know, there's also been a human touch where we can actually, um, uh, you know, uh, ask them to think critically, to think differently and also try to bring out the changes. And I must say that this has happened in my classes. Uh, if, I mean, Victor is one of the best, uh, uh, the example, um, if he's my student and, and uh, you can also see, because um, uh, this is often a complaint when I teach Pandita Ramabai, the students who are coming from the Delhi University, it might be LSI, it might be, uh, any college, the students will come and say that we did a BA honors in English literature, but we have been never taught who yes. Pandita Ramabai was or who Tarabai Shinde was or who, uh, you know, Savitri Bai Fulian in numbers of then again people. So I think that uh, those spaces uh, we have to actually see and keep challenge. And uh, right to education movement is very much there, which is trying actually reaching out as far as Maharashtra, I know that it is reaching to each, each village, right? Um, and uh, we have to go back because um, there's no other way out. We have to bring this because I also see that the, the continuous because uh, there's also been uh, uh, extended effort, even uh, even those who are in a distance education, uh, people like me, that everything, you know, editing should be done online, wedding should be done online. And the reason is that if Vibhuti or, uh, you know, somebody else is actually editing the material, I could able to see. Now, my question is that, you know, somebody who has expertise, what is my business actually to go and look into that matter? Right. So, uh, and I think that again, uh, I will come back to this ethical question that what kind of citizen, what kind of schools. So we need to revisit uh, the models of the schooling and we have no other way out actually to come out, to come together, to build the solidarity and uh, to take forward this. Yeah. So now Dr. Uma Chakravarti, what is your response? Yeah. Hello. Uh, Dr. Rakesh Ganguly, would you like to say after that? I think, yeah, oh, you might stay. No, no, I, I actually don't want to. I think um, uh, what I hear, because I'm outside of the formal teaching process now, um, that um, certainly I think the political design is to ensure that people, students do not congregate because they are troublesome and you and the youth is something that they uh, youth energy and uh, criticality they don't want to engage uh, obviously they had to have to marginalize that so there is a stand there's, there's a concerted plan to not go back to regular teaching um, so that is something very clear to that extent i think the fear of young people thinking is greater than anybody, any other category. So if the young begin to think critically, then automatically it means that the whole structure that they have created is going to um, be questioned. Yeah. So I, I think that that is um, uh, yeah. absolutely true. Uh, but equally, you, you, you'll find that, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the choices were so few because uh, they forced it on, uh, on people and it was very difficult to resist it it's it has disastrous consequences. People, students don't know each other. They are um, sitting over there. They, in fact, they don't even switch on their own uh, videos. 
So they don't see each other. They don't see, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking not only of the teacher student, but the student student, what is the relationship between them? So there's absolutely none, you know, there's absolutely, so there's no possibility of engaging, uh, arguing, discussing and so on. And uh, so I can see that they will want to do massive distance education because they also, it, it, it also reduces, uh, it of course reduces the political um, threat, but uh, it, 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 it is also a case of, um, they'll save on their money. They'll, at the end of the day, you know, they'll be, they'll be not, they're hardly, in any case, they were hardly investing on two things that they haven't invested on in historically uh, is, um, um, and they're both connected at the end of the day, <clears throat> the, the, the uh, health and education. And today both are in crisis. And the pandemic has shown us that, that is the, the massive amount of crisis that is coming from these two sectors. You did not, you did not create the, uh, uh, you know, uh, structure for it. So uh, in that sense, I think they, uh, we can see their agenda. How do we uh, move in the direction of resisting it? And I board of studies are told to have a multiple choice question. So yeah. choices are also given. Yeah, so yeah. So so even it's, it's really horrible. And, uh, you know, you're, um, yeah. Yeah. So you can see the, you, you can see their design. Correct. What is our alternative to it? That's the question that we'll have to, you know? Yeah, yeah. So now Dr. Ajay, over to you. Yeah, you have this. Yeah, I think we have already said that the design is very clear, but uh, the problem is uh, uh, basically this in terms of reach, you know, that uh, their argument seems to be that this kind of digital education will give uh, faster, a quicker access to everyone. So that's where, what is our counter to that? I mean, that there seems to be a case there that, you know, I mean, it's going to take a hell of a lot of time uh, for us to build universities of that magnitude to include the kind of uh, population groups that we have. So that first question that, you know, that uh, uh, we have already lagged behind. India has not invested last 70 years, health and education have lagged behind. So digital has become like a shortcut, quick fix solution that way they're arguing which makes some sense. I mean, you know, something is better than not having any education at all. Uh, so that's their the strong point in their uh, case is that, that digital. We are asking for more abstract things of life of mind, critical mind, you know, but they, what they are talking is a very hands-on, immediate uh, kind of a solution. Second bigger question that perhaps we, we will also have to confront at some point, which European uh, societies have confronted in various ways, uh, is uh, that are we proposing, uh, you know, the, uh, the purpose of education, are, are we envisaging everyone to have higher education? Should everyone have a PhD at the end of the day? What, what, at what level are we thinking? The problem is that education is so key for social prejudices, uh, to overcome social prejudices, that we really do not have a vision. Now, Europe went in very clearly, you know, if you look at Germany and other systems, even United States, they have uh, their dropout is not a big issue. I mean, employment people uh, drop out on their own. There are various systems. I mean, you know, today US has introduced Common Core system where they're kind of standardizing education, uh, things of that kind. So uh, here also we don't have clarity. What 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 are we talking about? Are we talking about merely people being literate? Should everyone have higher education? So I think again that's a big challenge. We have to sit and discuss those details. I feel are very important. Third level, I think <coughs> alternative neoliberalism is proposing like universal basic income scheme you know even guy standing talks about uh, these are uh, squarely at one level uh, neoliberal uh, but on the other hand given the nature of crisis from the ground in terms of basic communities basic survival question then uh, are we in an ethical uh, place to kind of reject these alternatives once you accept them then the system is going to push them as alternative that many of them will be out of the workforce like they're going to be out of education have very basic subsistence living, and that's how they're going to reproduce the uh, workforce. So even there, how are we going to intervene? I think uh, we'll have to get into the details of it. Cannot be an abstract uh, question. Yeah. Okay, so now I think there are, uh, Dr. Rakesh Ganguly's uh, are the comments. They are not questions. I read all three of them, and they have been taken care of by your intervention. So now I think we can sum up. And uh, now I would like to make my concluding remarks that all three of you have made a passionate and thought-provoking presentation 
uh, first started by Dr. Srita Patil, an equally passionate and powerful discussion by Dr. Uma Chakravarti, Ajay uh, Gurvarti, and uh, which has enriched our discussion. Even the Q&A session was extremely important and the very pointed sharp questions were uh, posed. The points raised by Dr. Smita Patil's presentation and the responses of Dr. Uma Chakravarti and Dr. Ajay Gurvarti have shown with concrete evidence that we are far from constitutional guarantee of equality, equal opportunity, equal treatment by the state and non-state actors uh, with socioeconomic and political power and multitude of problems under the COVID-19 pandemic health emergency have overwhelmed us. Feminist civil rights activist Kimberly Crenshaw rightly says, and I quote, if you see inequality as them problem and also unfortunate other problem, that is a problem. We got to be open to looking at all of the ways our system reproduces these inequalities, and that includes the privileges as well as the harms, quote complete. The current health emergency has exposed the most bizarre aspect of the structural inequalities that share our hierarchized gendered lives. These are also the moments to challenge this inequality so that we can rebuild society's new normal, uh, which I think is a popular term, which is used currently, that offers social justice, gender justice, economic justice, safety, and dignity to everyone. Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar gifted a humankind, a taxonomy of an emancipatory vision. Uh, we can apply his perspective to evolve a new normal that must be just for all. Thank you, Dr. Smita Patil, Dr. Uma Chakravarti, Dr. Ajay Gudavarti, and uh, for enlightening session. And thank you, Dr. Arjun Kumar, Dr. Swati Solanki, Dr. Anshula, and all the participants, uh, Nagmani Rao, Dr. Vikram, and all those who also wrote very uh, vigorously all their comments when the uh, presentations were made and also asked very pointed, sharp questions. Thank you. Employee team, yeah. Yes, yeah. Anshula will uh, pro formally propose a vote of thanks. Anshula. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, Kuti Ma'am has really said it all, but once on behalf of Impre Gender Impact Studies Center, I would like to formally thank all of you for joining us today for this web policy talk. Um, we are grateful to our speaker, Dr. Smitha Patel, for taking out the time to be with us today and uh, for delivering this uh, very powerful and uh, thought-provoking presentation on relations of caste and gender in the time of the pandemic, challenges for feminists and social media. Thank you, ma'am. We are grateful to uh, Vibhuti ma'am for joining us as the chair for the session and for enriching the deliberations with her insights as always. Uh, thank you to our discussants, uh, Dr. Uma Chakravarti and Dr. Ajay Gudavarti for uh, being with us today and for sharing their very um, stimulating perspective. Thank you. Uh, we are grateful to all of uh, the participants who joined here on Zoom or on Facebook Live and uh, participated so actively with their questions and comments. Thank you for joining us. And we hope you continue to join us in the country to work on the talk. Thank you. And we wish you a good day. Thank you. Brilliant session today. Thank you, everyone.